have an old school mass scale, mass not weight, that measures a certain amount of grams that are placed on this platter here. So it goes over just a little above 500 grams and we have different units. We have the hundreds, the tens, and the ones place of units for grams here. So here we have a 20 gram mass that Mark is holding and it claims to be 20 grams. So we'll see how precise that measurement is. Usually for lab experiments, we want to measure it out and use the real mass measurement that we have. So we can see he slid this to the 20 gram mark we have zero on the hundreds and zero on the ones. So we're gonna take a look at the zero skill here and you can see that it's almost zeroed out. So it looks like we could add maybe another gram here and we get it a little closer to the zero mark. So really this looks like it's more like 21 grams as opposed to that 20 gram claim. Now, if we wanted more precision, we'd have to use some other tools. Now, here we have another mass measuring device. This is a spring scale. Some of these will measure in terms of grams. Some of these will also measure in the derived unit, the Newton. Here we also have the imperial units of ounces. Okay, so we, again, we have this claimed 20 gram mass. Let's see what our spring scale measures it to be. Looks like it's just above 20 grams. So that looks close to 21 grams as we measured on the other scale. Here we have another spring scale. This one measures both grams and newtons. We have it zeroed out and we're going to place this 20 gram mass on it again and see what it measures out to be. So it's wiggling a little bit at the 20 gram unit. And some of these can be tricky to scale at zero. So this one's showing us 20 grams and close to 0.2 newtons. There's a good derived unit you could get from the gram. See if you could get that 0.2 newtons in your calculations. Last, modern technology allows us to use these digital scales for mass and the precision goes to one decimal place. So let's go ahead and see if our 20 gram mass measures out to be about 20. Here we get 20.0. So it's uh, rounded off to the tenths place. So we can see that the um, estimate or the claim of 20 grams is pretty accurate, but for all measurements of mass, we like to make sure that we measure out the mass and get the experimental values when we conduct our experiments. precise measuring device that goes to one hundredth of a millimeter. So uh, Mark here will show us what 15.0 millimeters look like. He's opening up the jaws to match up to make that 15.00 millimeters. Okay, that's what it looks like. All right, so now we're going to measure this width of the hexagonal nut. Mark will show us what that reading is. What do we got there, Mark? So we've got, there's 15, then we want one over. So we have 16 millimeters and what do we got? 16.31 uh, millimeters. All right, that's your micrometer, and we'll compare it to other measuring devices. Here we have a non-digital caliper. These are the ones that we've used before we got the digital ones, and it's more precise than your standard ruler, but it can be a little tricky to read. You have, you know, your tenth, your scale of millimeters here, and then to get it to the nearest tenth, you have this bottom scale. You've got to use the zero mark and see where it lines up or you use any of those marks to see where it lines up. Now our zero looks like it lines up best with the 16th position, so we could call this to be about 16 millimeters in width. That would be the best approximation here. Now if the one lined up in a different position, we would use that as our decimal place. We have a digital caliper. Yes, for those who had to 
bare through old fashioned calipers, this is remarkable. And what we're gonna do is measure this, the width of this hexagonal nut in this digital caliper. So we need to open its jaws. A measurement that goes to the nearest hundredths of a millimeter. So that reads off 16.29, is that it? Mm -hmm. All right, perfect. So that matches with our micrometer pretty well. Using one of these old fashioned rulers, you can see you have to do some rounding off. You'll get some round off error. And trying to measure to the edge of this hexagonal nut width, we get about 16 millimeters, but there we can't get the same precision as we did with the calipers. Here we have a digital time stopwatch, which is much like how your stopwatch on your phone works to record time increments. Now the one challenge we have to be aware of is reaction time, which introduces error in your experiments. So we're gonna time a lot of experiments and you do want to be aware of that and try to add in as many cycles as you can to get a good timing average. So here we're gonna do one with a simple pendulum and we're gonna time the oscillations. And if I release this pendulum here, we're going to time 10 cycles that's uh, going back and forth 10 complete times, and we'll try to get an average time here. For One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so what did we get for that? We had about nine seconds and 23 of a second. <laughs> So what would happen is if we just did one cycle, if we do one cycle now, we got 92 hundredths of a second. So what we'd have to do is compare that 93, 9.2, three seconds I divided by 10 and compare that to this other measurement. Uh, one single oscillation will introduce more error than having an average from the 10 oscillations. So you would measure the time for 10 oscillations, divide by 10 and get a better average. Now in this case with this pendulum, can we see the pendulum for a second? Um, it might have been better just to do six oscillations because as you can see it um, the energy loss has made the swings not entire complete swings. So I would say for something like this, you might want to divide by six. Time it for six oscillations and then divide by six to get the most accurate result you can get on your DIY pendulum.